From armed robberies and drug dealing to prominent figure in Saskatoon's recovery community, Peter Wickett joined me in the studio to share his experiences lost in addiction and to bring some very useful insights and information to the podcast about the program that saved his life and continues to do so to this very day, Narcotics Anonymous. But before we get into it, what's up? My name's Dan, podcaster, keynote speaker, and advocate, and this is Hard Knocks Talks, your addictions podcast. Now, let's get into my talk with Peter Wickett. This is Hard Knocks Talks. What's going on, my friend? Oh, man, just excited, honored, a little fearful, All, all the good emotions just to be here, but like... Thank you so much for giving me the opportunity. You know, we've talked about this for a long time. Yeah, yeah. It's been a while. I was chasing Danny around, Daniel around for a while. I'm chasing you around. And Tyler Maltman, he's the next. Yeah, and and the interesting thing is, is I was still like, I've always always been open-minded because I try to be open-minded through my program today. But uh, the willingness wasn't completely there. And then all of a sudden, just life's just been pushing me towards speaking. And it's been pushing me towards coming here. And all of a sudden, then I run into you. Uh, you were one of the first, you were one of the first people that I, that I met. I remember walking into the Grace Westminster Church, into the basement. And I don't know why this is burned into my mind, mm-hmm. but like, I just saw you and you were walking around um, with this, not blank, but sort of like peaceful sort of uh, in, in the jersey. And you were just hugging everyone. Mm-hmm. You know, and that's like my first memory that I have of you. Uh, Peter, so. the, Peter, the NA greeter. That, yeah. That's what some of my friends called me then. Cause if you came to my home group Sunday night, for sure, those two, mm-hmm. I was, a, it was a big deal for me to not allow that addict to sit in the corner. Plan is his, planning is escape. Mm. Right. And mm-hmm. know who I am as a person. I know what my personality is mm-hmm. and I know what I bring to the table when it comes to welcoming and loving people. Mm-hmm. And I take that to heart. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Well, it was interesting too, because I was like, um, bro still walks like a gangster. <laughs> <laughs> and dressed like one still then, yeah, I think too. Yeah. 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 You yeah, had the jersey and everything. Seven years you... ago. Yeah. 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 I hadn't done as much work maybe as I needed to at that point in time. Oh, and did we ever, I don't know if we'll ever get there. No. Yeah. Yeah. No. We, we do it on, we do it on God's time. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So, why don't you tell us a little bit about, I mean, I mean, I know I want to, we want to focus on, on recovery mm-hmm. today. We want to focus on, on the struggles that even into long-term recovery, but mm-hmm. uh, I think in order to really paint an accurate picture, um, why don't you take us back and, and tell us a bit about your story? Like how sure. did it all get started for you? Yeah. And, and I want to go right back. Yeah. So my story, and, and this has come from doing a lot of work, both inside and outside the rooms. Um, I am a narcotics anonymous, um, guy i mm-hmm. i recover through the narcotics anonymous program but i seek outside help mm-hmm. i need more than that mm-hmm. and through that outside help i've taken a look at the fact that i i'm born in 1976 in saskatoon mm-hmm. um to 15 and 16 year old parents wow oh yeah using heavily um they tried they tried i i've read the adoption records I have an, no animosity towards it. They tried. I was taken from the house at nine months. There was the system trying to help them become good parents for, I, I think it, in my mind, it's six to nine months when they finally make the decision that the best thing to do is give me up for adoption. Mm-hmm. I have no regrets towards that. I am proud of them for making that decision. Mm -hmm. I won the lottery with the family that adopted me, but I've also come to learn the stats linking adopted kids to addiction. Mm -hmm. There's something, and I'm not smart enough to know this, and I I, I told you before, I have to paraphrase because I don't remember stuff, but it's something about that first two and a half years when you're a kid and, and the bond you have with your parents and whatnot, and when that's broken and when you're taken away and put back and taken away and put back that that does something to you and your self-worth so you you were adopted and you went back to your biological no 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 so in the because i was taken at nine months and for six months i was back and forth back and forth to um foster homes oh and and whatnot like they tried and then the drugs would come up again and cps would get called and i would get taken back again Mm -hmm. right um Mm -hmm. so there's that confusion right that hey where's this love i need where is this comfort that i need right Mm mm-hmm and then I went to, my understanding is at least a couple, I always share that it was three foster homes and they were all women, but I'm not positive. I know one of them. Uh, I did throughout my growing up. She would be deceased now. 
Um, we visited her a lot. And so we're talking another woman, caregiver and whatnot. And then I'm adopted. So she's abandoned me mm -hmm. as well in my child mind, right? Mm -hmm. She's not there. I don't know why. Uh, so then I'm adopted by this magnificent family. And from what I'm told, I am very hesitant of my mother. She's the caregiver. She's the one who's home raising me, but I do not trust women. And we're talking two and a half years old. Yeah. I do not trust women. Did you carry that into your oh, later yeah. years? It's still today. Still today? Still today. Yeah. I'm working right now on why I still struggle with abandonment issues, specifically around women. Yeah. I'm doing some work. We were talking earlier and, and you stopped me, right? I'm working yeah. on a step four and we can get into that a little later on what that is and what I'm going through right now because mm -hmm. it's super cool. Mm -hmm. But I'm, I'm looking at that right now because yes, I struggle with that. My dad comes home from work. My dad's an educator. My dad's a great guy. Uh, my dad is was one of the leading professors of theology in the world when he retired. And he was given an honorary ministry in the Anglican in church and worked at the cathedral because of his knowledge and dedication to the faith, right? Mm -hmm. These are the type of people who, uh, who raised me. And I like to say that with all that and how holy my dad is, and he is, uh, my mom was holier than him. Mm -hmm. She, I believe, has been my angel my whole life, right? Mm -hmm. We'll get into that as well, I'm sure. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, so I go to my dad. My mom wins my heart because of who she is. It takes some time, mm -hmm. but she wins my heart. Um, she becomes my everything. I follow her everywhere. Um, I trust her completely. Mm -hmm. um, this is the type of woman that, that she is. And at 12 years old, she gets lupus. She gets, I don't know, or sorry, no, she had lupus already, but the lupus kicks in. Um, she becomes very sick. And for six years, I watch her die. Um, 12, how, sorry, how old were you? When she died or when she got lupus? Lupus, yeah, lupus I, is 12. At 16, I leave the house because I can't handle it anymore. I run away to the streets. 18, she dies. So two yeah. years later. Yeah. Did you, uh, when did the drugs enter the picture? Was it alcohol? Was it drugs? 15, when did that start happening? 15 years old, alcohol. Mm -hmm. um, and I blacked out the very first time. Yeah, me too. Yeah, blacked out, woke up in the canoe in some random backyard. Mm -hmm. uh, no idea where I was. Mm -hmm. uh, three day, or three yards down from where we were partying. Uh Really, I, re and I remember waking up like, what happened? I'm not sure if this is okay. I hadn't gone to many parties. Mm -hmm. Like, it was like the six people that I hung out with. And, and, and keep in mind, like, I'm this guy, and this came up in my step work yesterday too. Um, I'm the guy that like, I am, I look up to, I envy, and I'm shy around the cool kids, but I am outgoing and cooler than the nerds. Mm. I'm right in the middle there, right? I'm not good enough and I'm, I'm better than, mm -hmm. right? I, and which is fair because I mean, I, I think that's, that, that's kind of humble. We're kind of in the middle, right? But I don't, I don't feel like I fit in anywhere either, mm -hmm. right? Um, so I'm with this oddball crew that I hung out with. Um, and uh, yeah, I'm, I don't know how I feel about blacking out. I feel shame because I don't think it's normal, but I'm not really sure because I've only drank around normal people and I've never seen the end of the party. Did, did people like hold you up in high regard? Cause like you went so hard and, and that's what I'm getting to. Yeah. Yeah. I come back and they're like, man, you were the best. Yeah. Yeah. I'm like, okay. Right. Uh, and I, I have to take your word for it. I a, guy with, <laughs> a guy with no identity. Like that was my first taste of ego. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. So soon after this, I leave to the streets. Um, and, and, and through a method of survival, I start breaking into cars. Um, mm -hmm. just cause these guys I'm hanging out with, they're like, what are you going to do, man? And I'm like, I know, didn't have a plan. Mm -hmm. Um, my dad and I got in a fight and he says, if you don't like the rules here, you can leave. And I was sheltered. I had no idea what was in store for me. Mm -hmm. Um, and I've had this conversation with my dad and if I knew then what I knew now, I would never have walked out that door. Yeah. My, my, my journey was wild. Yeah. And I, I, if I knew what was out there and, and what I was going through, I think I would have stayed in that nice sheltered little comfy. Yeah house right yeah um so anyways i i end up uh i i become a thief well no i was already a thief i i i stole i stole from a young age i i remember stealing from stores at like four or five years old mm -hmm. my dad believes that this has to do with uh uh a, f uh, a need to survive from mm -hmm. being in the foster homes and stuff like that because mm -hmm. some of the stuff that he understood was that i was 
very shy, very shell-shocked in these foster homes. I didn't know what was going on. I didn't know why I was there and whatnot. I wouldn't eat at the table. So they would leave food around for me because I would eat on my own and I would sort of stay off to my off by myself, right? Were you were you treated well in these foster homes? As far as I know, yeah. The the last woman for sure. There's no doubt in my mind. Mm -hmm. Um I, I have no knowledge of any abuse through my, my whole life. Mm -hmm. Um not not from caregivers anyways, right? Mm -hmm. Um mm -hmm. So yeah, like gravitate towards the streets here. I'm I'm on the streets. I have no plan. These guys are we're talking now 16 years old. So what 1992 on the east side of Saskatoon, mm. nobody locks their doors. Yeah. Nobody. Mm. We're making a thousand dollars a day. Wow. So thousand dollars a day. Back then, that's easy. I mean, that's still decent money. That's still decent money. And I'm yeah. 16. Yeah, yeah. With absolutely no cost because I'm living with you know, a friend's family, single mom, three teenage boys needs yeah. a welfare check, right? Yeah, she needs yeah. a social services check. So she moves me in and yeah. we actually fraudulently do my attendance record. So that, because it's a dot matrix printer back then. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I'm not going to school, yeah, right? Like yeah. literally kicked out of the house, stopped going to school. And, there, and, and as far as you know, at this time, the only things you're good at is getting high and drunk and breaking into cars. Not that, even really getting high and drunk at the time. I'm literally just like, yeah, we party when we can party. It became like a weekend thing because of the high school parties were going on. We would join them. Um, I was very hesitant because I don't like losing control. Never have. I'm not. I'm not a uh, knock me out kind of uh, get loaded guy. Mm. Um, and I bl I black out when I drink. I've always said I blacked out every time, and that's a lie because I'm sure I've had one or two here where I haven't blacked out. But like, if I'm going to party, I'm blacking out, and something bad's happening. Yeah, like that's that's uh. I would bet if I'm if I was a betting man, yeah, and I am, yeah. <laughs> I would bet on the blackout, right? Yeah, like because yeah. that's probably where it's linked to, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, yeah. So, anyways, like we're we're making all this money. It grabbed like, and I'm gaining a personality here. Everybody knows. Oh, car stereos became a thing. Yeah, I was master. Yeah. Um, I was telling you earlier. I went for I went for lunch yesterday with three Saskatoon City Police officers. One of them is one of my best friends today. Uh, he has, he, he and I had developed a relationship, uh, through the streets. He's arrested me several times. The other one was the last guy who was arrested me. Another guy who, who really looks up to who I am today. Mm -hmm. These guys have told me more than once that I am their hope in a hopeless job. My mm -hmm. relationship with them is their hope. And that, that, that brings emotions in me to know that, that what I'm doing, like I'm on the right path. Right. Uh, anyways, to go back, like. Uh, you, you know, we're doing, we're doing the crime and it's, it's, it's escalating. We're breaking into stores. Now there's no bars on the window back then, right? Mm -hmm. We're smashing windows out and stealing, uh, smokes and stuff. And now keep in mind, like I'm an athlete, not so much anymore. My body's <clears throat> taking a beating and, and, uh, I got complacent in my, in my recovery and focused on work and parenting and which I'm okay with. But, uh, like I, I'm an athlete at 16. I can run like the wind. The cops can't catch me. <laughs> Um, and like, and I'm running scared. Right. So like yeah. even better, right. <laughs> <laughs> <You know? Yes. clears throat> um, I'm making all this money, but more importantly, I'm my ego, like the, I'm learning what ego is. And I've, I've shared this before and someone actually put it in a book. Ego was the greatest drug I ever did. Mm -hmm. But with this, the drugs start coming, mm -hmm. uh, the drug dealers in high school want the stuff that I have. Everybody wants the stuff. I become the guy for stuff. Like I'm, I'm stealing stuff before people even know it. And we're talking like the electronic revolution here. Mm -hmm. Like the first digital camera I stole from a car that from California, like I, you couldn't even buy them in Canada. Mm -hmm. And I'm just like, yeah, you, you, my stereo got stolen when I was, it was probably, probably you. Yeah. There's like, I, I apologize. Yeah, um, yeah. I hope this can be part of the amends. Uh, Cr Crankensteins weren't that good anyways. So yeah, it was probably me. Then I had a few of those. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I, I say like, Anyways, uh, that's where I was going with the cops. Uh, they were laughing because uh, they're like, you remember, you remember the one time uh, uh, there was an article in the paper that uh, crimes of the nature that I did were down 70% in the last four months. And I had been in jail for four months. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. Like, and so I was like, yeah, what, right. The cops mm. are considering like buying you out. Yeah. Right. Um, <laughs> 
And yeah, uh, you know, it's that that's who I became. And and like I ran with it. Um, don't get me wrong, we love the money, became addicted to the money. But yeah, let me just let's take a, a pause there just for a sec. Now mm. you're 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 making a thousand dollars a day, and and I said, Well, you know, you're get you're good at getting high and drunk, and you said not at this point. So you're making all of this money. What are you spending it on? Oh, we're taking 10 people go-karting for an hour. Okay. Yeah, stuff like that. Like okay. when there is a party. We buy all the booze. So you had a squad then? Oh, yeah. Everybody, well, why wouldn't they? Like, yeah. there's a free ride here. Yeah. Right? Here's a free ride. This guy is wild, right? And, and like, it, I became this this entity. I became notorious, right? Mm -hmm. um, and I, I was saying how I was laughing earlier with you how, like, you know, like, notorious is Al Capone. But, like, yeah. in our minds, I was notorious. In, in my society, yeah. in, in my... Um, my group and yeah. the people who knew me, I was. Well, crime went down 70%. Crime so, went down 70%. I mean, I think yeah. that that qualifies it as does. notorious. It does. Um, <laughs> it's because you didn't have a Tommy gun. You know? <laughs> right. Fair <laughs> enough. Um, like, it, it's fair to say that I was, at the time that I retired, the most notorious thief in Saskatoon's history. And mm -hmm. that, that comes from my buddy who's a cop. That Those are his words, right? Um, I mean, that's a that's a cool title, whether it, you're in recovery or not. It, I mean, it, that's it impactful. It, it is, right? Yeah. Um, and like... And, and why I bring that forward, because I don't want to glorify all of that. I just want to say that someone that into it, yeah. someone that hardcore can come out, can come out and become who I am today. Mm -hmm. Like who I am today is a father of two. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm, I'm a mentor to many men, mm -hmm. right? I talk to a lot of people every single day about recovery, right? I'm a boss and I'm the foreman on, on a, on a, gluten-free oat processing plant build right now right like <laughs> no cool. I, no idea how to build one of those right but they're like can you do it i'm like yeah for sure i can right and again like we were talking about <clears throat> addicts sometimes make the best leaders right mm -hmm. because i'm multitasking which is what my brain needs to do right mm -hmm. so anyways the uh, crime leads to the drugs um and I, and for me, it's 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 um it's alcohol on the weekends again i don't love alcohol because i black out a lot and I don't like blacking out, <clears throat> um, but a lot of weed, smoking a lot of weed, my brain needs to calm down. I'm ADHD unmedicated, mm -hmm. right? 21 years old, I go away to the oil rigs because um, an incident happens that scares me in town. I think I'm looking at a lot of time. Nothing ever, uh, uh, never comes about it. So I run away to the oil rigs for three months in Lloydminster and I come back with about $35,000 get fired because I have a bad attitude and I slapped my, uh, stole the boss. Of car me. Well, <laughs> yeah. I actually didn't do much crime at that time. I didn't need to cause yeah. I was rolling in the money and I worked too much. Uh, only job I ever had, by the way, mm -hmm. um, up until this point, I delivered papers until the day that I left my parents house, had that job for a three month. It was 90 days. I was gone for exactly. Mm -hmm. Um, and never had another job till I was 33 years old. Mm -hmm. Um, so, what finally did it then? Like, what was it that, I mean, did you actually know, let's take a step back where, did you ever have any stints of sobriety? Like, did you like the first time you went into the rooms, you were, that was it for you or were there attempts made along the way? Uh, yeah. So there was one. So when I came back and this leads right into that, when I came back, uh, the guy I got all my weed from was like, Hey, I've got this cocaine. He's younger than me, mm -hmm. right? So I'm 21. I'm 21. He's graduating through the drug dealing right is what's happening i had graduating through the, the, the criminal thing he bought almost all my stolen property off me because he could make profit off it and mm -hmm. i sold it to him for cheap because he bought it in bulk right um and he's like you should try it um and in my opinion he saw he's he, it was a business decision for him to give me cocaine he he knew how i was as an addict he knew how i used like i was all in it i did not care Mm -hmm. I don't care was the number one thing to come out of my mouth. Mm -hmm. Number one thing. Uh, that spiraled fast, fast. From the first time I used it to the time I would consider myself full-blown addicted, we're talking less than two months. Mm -hmm. um, I sniff it for uh, maybe six months to a year, and then it's crack for about a year, and then intravenous drug use. Mm. Hardcore. What were your thoughts? Um, on that, when, when you were going through that transition, were you like, oh man, that's trouble. Oh man, this is trouble. Oh, here's a needle. Oh, this is bad. Or was it just like, you got to keep the party going. There was no even thought of consequences. Uh, the needles, I knew it was like, I knew it, uh, it wasn't getting high on crack anymore. That's how much we smoked in a year. Mm -hmm. Um, keep in mind, like I had money. Um, 
gravitated towards me. At this time, I'm doing a lot of armed robberies too. Whoa. Um, and, Just like throw uh, that in there nonchalantly. Oh, oh yeah. Like a lot. Uh, we did. Yeah. And I can't get too deep into them because I've only been convicted of one of them. Um, and it's it's something I, I, I have a lot of shame around today, but I don't live in that shame because I know how toxic that is. Mm -hmm. um, and I've processed through it and all. And I know that it was... <clears throat> that's not who I am as a person that was driven by addiction. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, anyways, where was I going with this? So we get $50,000. This is the one I got convicted with $47,000 from an armed robbery. It was actually set up. So it can, was considered a theft, not a robbery. Um, and I end up on the ankle bracelet. You asked me about the stint. That's where I was going with it. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> the one stint I had where I was trying to go clean, uh, I remember sitting in court. My dad's there. It's, is it the first time? I want to say it's the first time I told my court. It was the first time that he got me a lawyer. My lawyer was Morris Bodner. Morris Bodner is a close family friend. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Let's put it that way. My dad and I um, worked together in church mm -hmm. and whatnot. I needed him for that one. I, I should have got time for it. I get an ankle bracelet. Right. And, and I, this is, this is, this blew me away. I remember this. I walk in there on an armed robbery charge. I have for sure a B and E on my adult record, for sure a couple breaking enters in cars and one car, one possession of a stolen car already on my record. I go in for what ends up being theft over 5,000, but like on an armed robbery charge. Um, and, and I get the ankle bracelet for 18 months. Wow. Glad, uh, they went through the the glad you effects, right? Your upbringing and and whatnot. Oh, mm -hmm. his dad's an Anglican minister and this up, up, up upstanding member. Wait a minute. So hang on, hang on. So that you went through glad you glad you reporting? No. The, what's the is that the term I'm thinking of? Glad the glad you reports they go through, right? Yeah, Where yeah. they look at your history and who you are. That's right? that's really interesting, right? Cool. And they, and they bring it up. Yeah, yeah. So I'm sitting next to this kid. He's 18 years old. He's native, mm -hmm. and he comes from a rough family. Mm -hmm. He's in on. Theft under one five thousand gets mm -hmm. a year in jail. Mm -hmm. Very minor, minor uh, juvenile record. Here's me with this record. I am full blown criminal at this time. Haven't had a job. I can't say I'm doing anything good. <clears throat> cocaine is like I've admitted to shooting cocaine and and doing all this stuff. Like I am not, in my opinion, the person who should be getting out of jail in this situation. Mm -hmm. And my lawyer says sometimes it's who you know. And, that, and that's what our system is, right? Like, mm -hmm. it, it is who you know sometimes. Lots of times uh, it, is. it is. And, like, that, the hope there was that, hey, with all these positive um, influences in his life, this will scare him into being straight. And I, I, I was about nine months of it uh, in this little basement suite on the ankle bracelet playing Tony Hawk Pro Skater. I actually did, like, all the gaps and everything. I did the entire checklist. I played it so much. Mm -hmm. And then <clears throat> that guy who gave me the cocaine shows up. Mm -hmm. Okay, here's the here's the part I haven't mentioned. I'm about to inherit six figures. Okay. I my grandpa had died two years before. It was a known fact at 25. I get it. A couple months before I turned 25, I'm on the ankle bracelet. This guy shows up and he's like, I need you to hold this for me. And it's cocaine. And this is to this date the best cocaine I ever did in my life. Mm. I can smell it across the room and through the bags. It's that potent. Oh. Like we're talking Did I remember making your mouth water? Uh, not anymore because cocaine took me to a place where I think it affected my central nervous system mm. and I see things. You still wag your jaw sometimes. Sometimes I do. Yeah. yeah. Um, that was definitely from the stimulants. That's actually one of the first things I also noticed about you. Oh, yeah. Walking around like a gangster wagging oh, yeah. your back, jaw. <laughs> back, then it was, back then it was really bad. Yeah. Like, oh shit, what did I get myself into? Yeah. And then he comes and hugs me. <laughs> yeah. Ba back then it was, it was still really bad. And I also, I drank too much coffee back then still because mm. I didn't think it affected me. Today... I know that like no coffee after noon, uh, like all that kind of stuff. Right. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. um, I forget where I was there. Uh, you got good cocaine from the oh, guy. Oh yeah. Who, yeah. And it was, it was on. Um, so he convinces me to move into his house mm -hmm. about a month before I get the inheritance and we're going to go hard. We're going to like throw this party house. We have, we do, we set it all up. Um, we buy keys of cocaine keys we're actually getting them from three different sources at the same time and we're mixing them around we're moving 100 pounds of weed a week i say we he is the one doing this i am absolutely like the biggest speed bump in us being successful mm -hmm. i'm like i need nine ounces of cocaine i've got it sold right and i disappear for a week and come back with a hundred dollars you do nine ounces of cocaine i did nine ounces of cocaine 
Yeah. What'd your dad say when it was coming around time to get this money? My dad cried when you told me my grandpa died and I was about to become uh, a wealthy man. He cried and we were in Midtown Plaza. I remember this. We were in Midtown Plaza. Still makes me sad. Um, I'll never forget the look on his face. Like he, he thought I was going to die. Yeah. And, and he did twice. I overdosed twice. I was brought on back cocaine. to life. Oh, yeah. That takes some work. Oh, yeah. Well, the one time I accidentally did the wrong, I don't know why, my partner uh, in crime had put all of the cocaine into one syringe and I woke up and it was sitting there and I didn't really look at what it was and I just filled her and did it. And it was, um, you know, it was, um, it was a lot. It was a lot. And mm -hmm. I was in, uh, what was it? The Northwoods. It was the Imperial 400 at the time or something like Northwoods, that. Northwoods. That's something. Oh, oh yeah. yeah. It wasn't as bad back then, but it was still something else. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I ended up overdosing on Idlewild Drive. Yeah. It was, it was, it was bad. Um, so as your dad said, oh, you're about to become a wealthy man. And he cried. He's like, you need to change. You had two years, right? Had two years to change. And uh, no, no, no desire. Yeah. Keep in mind at this time too. And I've looked at this. At that point in time, I knew nobody who had cleaned up. And I'm not saying that people I knew hadn't cleaned up. I just didn't know of it. They just disappeared out of your life. Self-centered, right? Yeah. Self-centered. I got the blinders on. All I care about is me. I mean, I, I didn't know about Narcotics Anonymous until I was 33 years old and I share this a lot. I did offender substance abuse pre-release program in jail seven times. I got 100% on it the last time. There's no way we didn't discuss it in there, mm -hmm. but didn't I, click. I didn't care. I was just jumping through the hoops. Yeah. You know what I mean? Um, so it was bad the next two years because I was, I was beelining towards that money and I had it focused on that money and like everybody gave me anything I wanted because they knew that money was coming. Mm -hmm. The money lasted six months. Mm. Yeah. It was not a good time. Um, I, I would like to say there were some fun times and, and there was, there had to have been, there was, but like, I'm not going <laughs> to sit here and say that, that, that those are fun times because today I know what real fun is, mm -hmm. right? Like I live a good life today, man. Mm -hmm. I go to sports events all over Canada, people well, I, all the time. Like I haven't seen it in a while, but I remember when I first came into recovery and I started following you and Kevin mm -hmm. Hastings and, and mm -hmm. Daniel and all yeah, of those. Yeah. And you see the pictures on like, you know, you're, you've got this rider game yeah, and yeah. you got the crazy hair oh, yeah. and like yeah, you're all dressed up and you're just having like, it's like, man, this guy's still on one. Like Pe it's been <laughs> people, people try and buy us booze when we go to the rider games because they think we're drunk. Yeah. Right. Yeah. But we're not, we're yeah, just yeah. having fun. Like yeah. that's who I am and that's who I need to be, but I don't need alcohol and drugs to do that yeah. today. Yeah. Right? So what happened after the two year stint? Was that, was that when you came crashing into recovery or no, like, no, like, what no, was no, it? No, no, Actually, interestingly enough, cocaine was starting to really kill me. I was becoming really psychotic. I was staying, I'm staying up anywhere from five to 10 days at a time. Mm -hmm. Um, and I'm in full psychosis after day three, uh, day three is like up. Day, day one, I'm, I'm a little grumpy. Day two, I'm a lot of fun. Day three, I'm wild and it's kind of a ro roller coaster. After day three, a lot of people don't want me around. I'm, I'm extremely dangerous at this point in time, yet I'm not really a violent guy. I'm defending myself from something and it's not there. Mm. Like legit not there. I remember the one time <clears throat> hallucinating and for sure it was on seven to 10 in this time. I, it was bad. I remember leaning against the window of this house and I'm hallucinating a parade of hell's angels that are looking for me going by on the street and they want to kill me. And like in, in an East side neighborhood, like just did not happen. Mm -hmm. I got to the point where I kept dropping the mini bath that I had. So I've taped it to my hands cause I'm in such psychosis, right? I fall asleep momentarily, wake up. Everybody's gone. Don't know what's going on. <clears throat> Check my pockets. I got no smokes, but I got 20 bucks. So I walked to the store. I walk into the store and the Chinese lady starts freaking out cause I have a bat taped to my hand. Right. Um, and I, I shouldn't don't, laugh, but like, it's kind of I like... don't realize it's there. I'm like, whoa, 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 whoa. I'm not right. <laughs> You're like, holding it up. Whoa, I'm like, whoa, whoa. I, I want smokes. And I tell her what kind. And she's like, take them all. And she throws them. And I grab one pack and I throw the 20 on. And I'm like, keep the change, right? Yeah, like, yeah, and hope I, your day gets and better. I, <laughs> yeah. Like, <laughs> so sorry to like traumatize you. I, I forgot I had a bat tape in my hand. <laughs> right? Sorry. So here's an interesting thing. And 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 I, I was listening. I was telling you this. I was listening to one of my best friends on your show just before I came here because... I hadn't had time to, that's uh, a lie. I, I just hadn't pressed just didn't do it. I just didn't do it. Mm -hmm. um, and I wanted to hear him before I came here just to, to remind myself about like this message and, and whatnot. And he's one of my mentors. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, 
Daniel P. Yeah, Daniel P. Check his episode out. Right. And uh, I forgot where I was going with that. Um, oh, oh, yeah. So I, in a weird way, um, this girl that I was super interested with that was super scared of me for a while, she ends up becoming, befriending me because her abusive boyfriend's there and it happened to be walking one, by one day and she knows he's scared of me. So she literally latches onto me and like, hey, and this, I hop, she brings me in her car. She's into crystal meth. Okay. I used to make fun of the crystal meth addicts at this time. I, mm-hmm. uh, I joke about them. They are like, they hang out in the same house as me. Uh, my good friend, Brandon, who's listening mm-hmm. to us right now and, and commenting mm-hmm. at his house. And, and they're like, Brandon is the reason why they all feel safe. Cause I love Brandon to death and always have, he's always accepted me fully and completely and, and been there for me. And, uh, so anyways, this girl takes me away and she's like, I don't like you on cocaine. And I'm not at the time she brings me, she's like, you're actually really cool when you're not on it. I'm like, okay, cool. Right. You're not mm-hmm. as scary or you're human and whatnot. She's like, kidnaps me pretty much. And like, she's super attractive. I'm super into her and I'm totally okay with being kidnapped with her. And, uh, <laughs> she makes me smoke meth for a week. Yeah. And in a weird way, meth have saved my life. Yeah. Um, because I'm no longer this guy who hides in a basement, goes out and does these armed robberies, who's overdosing, who's on psychosis and stuff, because it affects my brain in a different way. Um, I'm ADHD unmedicated, and I've come to learn that I so I've gravitated towards self medication because amphetamines are a medication that's used for ADHD, mm-hmm. um, and I'm all of a sudden functional, like maybe over functional. Mm-hmm. and whatnot this is where the crime goes through the roof like we go from like the early days i was very motivated before the drugs and then the cocaine it was really sporadic it was during those moments of clarity when i wasn't hardcore into it. basically when i broke mm-hmm. you know and i need to go get stuff but now i become a 24 7 I, I i literally I, I i say to everyone i work 24 7 mm-hmm. like i don't sleep i i am always working days and nights i don't need to do my crime under the cover of darkness anymore right i'm i'm doing whatever because I, my brain functions on this at a high level right um but unfortunately at too high of a level mm-hmm. I, I stay up for too long i fall asleep in stolen cars yeah stuff like this uh i become i fall asleep walking down the street mm-hmm. trying to find cars to steal and the cops roll up on me because they know who i am at this time because i'm out in the daytime i'm no longer hiding at night yeah and they know exactly who i am at this point in time i have become notorious and whatnot so i start doing time i start um I start getting caught for more stuff and I no longer call this lawyer. I no longer call my dad. I'm just like guilty. Yeah. I'm guilty. Yeah. Um, And I think part of it was because uh, I'm rolling into homelessness in the winter in in Saskatchewan and and, like I can do it because I steal cars and cars are warm and and like I live a pretty high functioning life for a homeless guy, but I did not maintain a residence outside of 910 60th Street, which is the correctional. Yeah. I did not maintain a residence outside of there for a decade. Yeah. Right. Let's hang on a second here. Let's take a quick break. For sure. We got a comment from my friend, Kathy. Mm-hmm. Well, from our friend, Kathy. Mm-hmm. Kathy, thanks for joining us today. Thanks for joining the conversation. Kathy says, I remember a time around your inheritance. You wrote me a handwritten note that I kept for years. Do, wow. you, do you remember that? No, I don't. You don't? No, I don't remember a lot from back then. Yeah. Yeah. So let's take a quick break here and a shout out today's sponsor. I'm always, I'm, I'm still getting used to to shouting this out because it's very meaningful to me. Uh, Pine Lodge, uh, the treatment center. I went to treatment uh, seven years ago. Love it. And uh, I I haven't looked back since. Um, When I got, yeah, sober seven years ago, it was great. Uh, Pine Lodge Treatment Center is uh offers addictions inpatient addictions treatment and aftercare programmings in regina saskatchewan to inquire about services or make a donation call 306-510-1891 to find their link in the description to make contact or to learn more about today's sponsors check out our new merch um or if you want to show us some love and buy us a coffee all of those links are also in the show notes below kind of struggled a bit on that one you did great. Yeah, I'm sure. uh, I was they, awesome. they they have they have a nickname Pain Lodge, and and I and I don't say that in a negative way. It's yeah. because of the way they do their treatment. And, oh, and it works. They they definitely it, it works. It yeah. they, they make they break you down to, to build you back up, and that's not my experience. That's what I've been. Yeah, shared. my my uh, my counselor uh, has since retired, uh, Diane H. But yeah, mm-hmm. um, she was she was very quick to inform me because when I walked through the treatment doors, like I thought I knew everything about recovery because who oh, my yeah. mom was right. Yeah, yeah. So it was very yeah. it didn't take her very long to sit me down and. and yeah shut me up and, and tell me that I knew nothing. But yeah, some great work happened uh, with me and her in that place. So always very grateful and honored to have the opportunity to to represent them on mm. the podcast. That's amazing. Right. 
So, so what, what finally did it for you, man? Like what, what brought you in? Uh, seven years I did meth. Mm -hmm. I went to jail every year. Mm -hmm. I spent the, I spent at least the winter in there every year. Intentionally. Sure. Coincidentally. Uh, Conveniently. Yeah. Conveniently. Yeah. <laughs> it, it worked. Right. Yeah. Come out 200 pounds ripped. Yeah. Right. Healthy. Ready clear, to go. clear head. Mm -hmm. uh, during this time, there are, well, my first time around in there was a disaster. I decided to bring the party inside mm -hmm. and smuggle an ounce of meth into the institution. Mm -hmm. Not a good idea. Mm -hmm. Like terrible idea. Um, the last thing you need to do is the days and the nights, <laughs> <laughs> right? Like, um, so never did that again. Um, I, I never once considered that. <laughs> not a lot of fun. And then yeah. like locked in a cell with people that are like less than desirable when they're high. Yeah. Great people when they're sober. Sending the people I, around my, you my, into myself, psychosis. Myself being one of them. And right? then locking yourself in a cage with them. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That doesn't really sound like a great, a great idea. idea. Um, anyways, I learned the hard way. Um, and so I wouldn't say I stayed sober, but I only smoked pot mm -hmm. while I was in there, mm -hmm. right? Veg out, nap in the day, go to work. I always got a job in jail. Um, I had to. They mm -hmm. did not like me on the unit. I would usually go to the kitchen. And then eventually one day, someone's like, ever thought about the welding shop? Nope. I, and in my head, I'm like, the welding shop has a 12-foot fence, man. I can get packages thrown over there, right? So I'm like, I, I think it's something I might be good at doing. And they're like, we agree. And they put me there. And I'm really good at it, not mm -hmm. necessarily as a welder, but by managing the shop and, and by like getting the projects done, because the better job I do here, the less attention it draws on the fact that I'm getting these massive packages thrown over the fence. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, like at one point in time, we're actually getting like a half a pound of weed a week brought in and like that's half, that's mine. Right. It's, it's just for bringing it in the guy who's, who's sending it in some, you know, big shot and whatnot, um, running the jail. And, and that's what I'm focusing on anyways. Last time I go in, I got these two workers. The one had been my worker the first time when I created the chaos, mm -hmm. absolutely hated me. And I'm like, oh no, she's going to be my worker. I'm like, oh, you must be thrilled to see me. She's like, oh, I, I don't mind at all. I said, I thought you hated me. She says, no, no, no. I hated Peter seven years ago. He was a kid and I hate kids. She's like, I don't have kids for a reason. They're mm -hmm. annoying. Mm -hmm. And I said, oh, she's like, you, you've grown up in here. She says, you've, you've matured. You're not a kid anymore. She says, actually, people really enjoy it when you're on the unit because you run a tight ship. Mm -hmm. I was like, really? She says, and they love you in the shop. Everything gets done. It gets done well. Mm -hmm. You realize you're really good at this, right? And I'm mm -hmm. like, mm, sure. I'm really good at a lot of things. I'm really good at anything I put my mind to. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you've seen the movie Blow, but he has the conversation with his dad. Mm -hmm. and he says, why do you do it, son? He says, because I'm good at it. And his dad says, son, you'd be good at anything you put your mind to, mm -hmm. right? And that is who I am, right? That, and, and whatnot. So these ladies, they harass me for a little while and they say, um, literally they print off applications for welding school and they're like, sit me down every time I have to come in every week. And they're like, Peter, like you can do this. Like you come from a background where you have the support, you can do this. And I'm like, I've had moments of clarity in jail where it's like, man, like I hit the streets at 16, a couple days after I turned 16, right? Like I've never had a fair shot. Mm -hmm. I've never given myself a fair shot. I don't know what a fair shot at life is. And I'm not going to lie. This is very appealing, but there was so much fear around doing it. Mm -hmm. There was so much fear I wouldn't commit. I looked at those papers every day for a long time. And I remember that the catalyst that pushed me over the ad was like, finally, they're like, okay, hey, look, you need to fill these out this week in order to get accepted. They had been working on getting me in like, it, it, it was, it was a thing. It was a rehabilitation thing, right? Like there, it, it was going to get probably approved if, if I applied. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, cause at that time it was like, are we going in the direction of corrections? Or are we going in the direction of jail? And these are the people that are trying to push for corrections. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, and so they're like, do you realize that school starts in September and I'm doing an 18 month bit this time. I'm doing a long time. Like I'm in, I'm in the winter and the summer and into the next winter kind of thing. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, and they're like, do you realize school starts in September? And I'm like, well, I don't get out till January. And they're like, exactly. It starts in September. They're like, exactly. <laughs> yeah. You'll have to go to a halfway house. Yeah. And I'm like, oh, you guys are going to let me in a halfway house? Like, I'm not even allowed in urban camp anymore in the minimum security because of who I am. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, and they're like, yeah, we've got it figured out. We can get you in there. 
but you need to commit, right? And so like then they're, 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 they're playing on me. They're like, you want to hang out in here and do this with these dudes or do you want to go to school with a bunch of nurses and, and whatnot? Oh, and I'm, yeah. I'm, okay, I'm in, right? Like <laughs> I'm in. Um, one thing I know, I did crystal meth one time and I went to the shopping jail. I built a ladder. It was an S by the time I was done because I did it at full speed, right? Like mock chicken. Mm -hmm. I didn't clamp it to the table. Like, you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. You're a welder, you know, like, yeah, and then yeah. I just pumped heat into it. I built it in like an hour. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's like spaghetti. Oh yeah. I look like a freaking snake, right? Yeah. Like with snakes and ladders, it was both. Oh, the snake yeah. and the ladder. <laughs> it was right? the snakey ladder. It was the snakey <laughs> ladder, right? And yeah. so I know that I'm not going to, I'm not going to accomplish school with this. Yeah. The time before my best friend, um, in, in using, he and I like two peas in a pot, he had had a trauma in his life and I'm not going to talk about it cause that's his experience and whatnot. But anyways, he found Narcotics Anonymous and I'd ran into him when I was on the streets and he had been out of jail for let's say a year. I don't know the exact timeline. And like he's gained weight, if not lost it. And mm -hmm. he's driving a car without gloves. And I'm like, what are you doing, bro? And he's like, it's not, it's not stolen. He says, right. And I'm like, what do you mean the car's not stolen, right? Like, mm -hmm. that's all we do. He's like, no, bro. Like, I've been doing this thing, this Narcotics Anonymous thing, right? And, like, I think that what caught me more than anything else, Daniel, is that, like, we're talking a year later and he's still smiling. He's still happy, mm -hmm. right? And I don't understand that. I don't understand life on the street happy. I don't understand life on the street smiling, right? Like, don't get me wrong. I laughed and stuff, but um, I think sometimes because I didn't want to cry, <laughs> you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, and so for a year, this has been in my mind. I don't know what this miracle is, this Narcotics Anonymous. But if he can get clean. And smile. And smile. And own a legit car. Have a job. His son lives is starting to come and live with him now. And that, that was one of the reasons why he, he, was, he was going to be a dad, right? Mm -hmm. um, I mean, if he can do it, why can't I? Mm -hmm. Right? So when I go to school, I go to Narcotics Anonymous. Uh, unfortunately for me, I, I did Pete's program. Uh, I went straight to step nine. I start making amends to everyone, telling them I'm sorry for all this shit I did. And mm -hmm. hey man, it's good. I've got like 90 days clean and I'm in Narcotics Anonymous. I'm and I'm sorry. And I'm sorry, right? <laughs> yeah. um, you know, and like we, we come to learn that, that um, and, and I was telling you this earlier, like, as I start working through the steps, when I find a word I don't truly understand, because to me, an amends was saying sorry, mm -hmm. but it is not. Mm -hmm. The definition of an amend is to right a wrong. To right a wrong, right? Mm -hmm. Saying sorry is part of that for it's me. A good jumping off point. It, it, it is definitely, you need to know, and, and, and only if I mean it. Like if I actually mean, I am really sorry for what I did to you, and I'm not going to do it again. This is what I'm doing to change it, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, so I stick around for 18 months. Uh, I think not, I did the schooling. Mm -hmm. I, I, I walk out with my first year and uh, 12 to 1800 hours for my second year. Got a job. Uh, well, I, I got two jobs. I had one for three months with a company building rebar cages for a bridge, mm -hmm. but it wasn't an apprenticeship. So it didn't help me. And then I got a job with Janie Welding. Um, and... I didn't know at the time I'd been hired for a 90 day contract. I was going to get laid off on the 89th day with everyone else who got hired. And on the 89th day, I got laid off. My girlfriend, it was a country song. My girlfriend left me. She took the dog and the couch. I was going to say the dog. And you're like, no, the dog. Yeah, oh, yeah. 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 Like it was a country song. And I had no tools in my toolbox. Mm -hmm. I had abstinence. Mm -hmm. That is it. That is all. Right. And I had no idea how to navigate the emotional pain that I went through that day the loss, the lack of self-worth, feeling like I didn't matter, feeling like I abandoned, all the things I've struggled with my whole life, mm -hmm. right? But I have no tools in, in order to deal with them. I walk out the door and a girl that I had used with my entire using career and slept with on and off happens to be walking by and I'm high within an hour. Mm. Uh, that was the most ruthless, most ruthless eight months of my life. You went off for eight months? Eight months and I went hard. Did the rooms wreck you were using? Oh, yeah. So now you... I hated me. Yeah. Because I knew better. Because now, we, I, to me, it's like when you walk into those rooms, they talk about step one, you admitted you're powerless and your life oh, was yeah. unmanageable. I think that, I think step one happens the second you walk through that door. The second you walk down those steps. That is surrender. Yeah. It is a surrender. Yeah. 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 But now, you know, you've even admitted to yourself that you have a problem and you can't stop because you've, you walked yourself through that door. Oh, yeah. 
So interestingly enough, uh, my friend who's the detective, he says, you know why I knew you, I've always known you're going to get it, why I facilitated a, a relationship with you? Because he used to come and sit in the interview rooms with me and, and bring me a coffee and, and we'd sit there and drink coffee and, and he would try and um, learn about, um, he wanted to learn how the addict worked and I found out since that he had personal reasons why and again, his, his, his experience, it's not fair for me to share them. Um, but he had personal reasons why he wanted to learn about the addicts and whatnot. And, and he says, do you know why I knew you were going to get it? And I said, why is that? He says, the first thing you used to say when you get arrested is I'm an addict. Mm -hmm. He goes, and I know you, you did that for a defense purpose, but he says, nobody admits they're an addict out there. Like, they're like, no, nah, I don't got a problem. It's all good. Right. Mm -hmm. And you're like, no, like, I got a drug problem. man. <laughs> like, <laughs> right. Yeah. I know I got one. I, yeah. I shrugged in my shoulders and go. Right. So yeah. like admitting has never been a problem for me. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, so yeah, back, back out using for that, for that eight months. And I go freaking hard, man. Um, hmm. yeah, it was, it was chaotic. Couldn't look myself in the mirror. Right. All mm -hmm. of this shame and guilt. Having um, having broken my family's heart was was terrible. Mm -hmm. um, Were you using to die? No, I, I've 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 said that in regards to my second relapse, and I'll, I'll get to that. Um, I, I think we're smart enough to know how to die if we want to die. Well, fair enough. Yeah, I know I am. Yeah, I know how to do it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't think I want to die. I don't want to feel. Mm -hmm. I don't want to feel the way I feel. Mm -hmm. um, and I remember that. I love it. I love it. I get choked up every time I talk about it. Every single time. I'm going to keep what I have by giving it away. Mm -hmm. It states that in our literature. And I was telling you earlier, and I hope to get into more of this. I am a Narcotics Anonymous literature guy. Mm -hmm. I am. Mm -hmm. I, I believe it's perfect. Mm -hmm. um, anyways, I get arrested for, oh, I get arrested for, um, for dealing. But I'm mischarged. I get there and I'm like, what did you charge the next morning? I'm like, what did you charge me with? They're like, uh. Oh, trafficking. What do you mean trafficking? Mm -hmm. I'm thinking to myself, I'm like, uh -huh. I'm guilty of possession for the purpose of trafficking, but I'm not, I'm not guilty of trafficking, right? And I don't want to get into the chaos of that because it was chaotic. I was making five grand a day stealing and dealing like it was freaking wild. I'm gambling it all away. It's a lot of freedom. I, I'm gambling it all away because I don't want to be successful. I refuse to be successful with this dirty money. Mm -hmm. I, I that's that's the only thing I can come so up with a, today. This was a, a decision of morality, or uh, you and, were and, just and was it conscious? I don't think so. Like yeah. I don't think I'm going out to. I like the spinning of the wheels. It helps my yeah. my brain. And five thousand dollars a day—that's a hell of an investment in a legit business. Like you hundred percent, you could and, build and, an and empire. And for for sure, for three to four months, I'm doing this. Yeah. Like I could have, I could have been. I could have been set. I mean, I would have lost it all. Anyways, mm -hmm. when, I'm sure they would have raided my house, right? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and I was scared of that kind of success um, and, and didn't think I deserved it, right? Mm -hmm. Anyways, I know I'm mischarged. I know I can beat these charges. But my number one, I have 110 convictions, I think it is on my record. It's something ridiculous. It's a book. It's a little novel. The majority of them are breaches. The notorious right? Peter Wicked. Most of them right are on breaches. The cover. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> Most of them are breaches uh, because how do you um, how do you stay home at ten o'clock when you're higher than a kite and up mm -hmm. for a week, you know, and all this? So again, I'm like, hey, I know how to beat this because every time they did gave me time, not every time, but most of the times I got time, it was because I I, I had these breaches. I would beat the criminal charge, but I picked up so many breaches in the meantime, and I can't beat a breach. Mm -hmm. I can't beat a breach. I was out at 12 o'clock and my curfew's at 10. Mm -hmm. I was carrying a screwdriver and I'm not allowed to have break and enter tools. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, so I would do time because I had such a lengthy record. And that was one of the things the police had been doing early on is building up my criminal record so that they could just give me time later on because they knew I was habitual. Mm -hmm. um, there was talk around this time about becoming, because the Habitual Offender Act had come in. And so if you're a habitual offender, they can give you an indefinite sentence. And they were talking about doing it for, they were specifically looking at me too and bringing it in for crime because they were like, this guy is a habitual, habitual criminal. Like he is a detriment to society right now. And I was, mm -hmm. I, insurance premiums are probably going up because of me. Like we were speculating at lunch the other day that it's fair to say I stole 5,000 cars. Wow. Like that's fair to say. I can't tell you how many armed robberies they did. B and E's. I, I didn't like the B and E's. Um, but regardless, um, I decided to go back to Narcotics Anonymous. 
Mm -hmm. I kind of do the program this time. I kind of commit to it. I kind of surrender. I go right back. Like I go straight back. I go straight back to Grace Westminster Church where I met you. Mm -hmm. That became my home group. And I committed to it. I went to it every week. I opened the doors every week for two years. I chaired most of those meetings because we only had two home group members when we started there. And <clears throat> the other guy with his work couldn't get there to open the doors very often. So I went all the time and I walked. I walked in the winter. I walked in the summer. I live downtown. It's uh, just off Broadway 10th, right? Mm -hmm. It's not far. It's a 20-minute walk. And I, I steal cars in minus 50. So whatever. Mm -hmm. right? Not a big deal. Um, and I worked the steps. Mm -hmm. I worked the Narcotics and Anonymous steps to the best of my ability. Uh, was my inventory searching and fearless? No, there was a lot of fear in it and whatnot, right? Mm -hmm. But I did the steps and I came to trust the, the process. I came to trust that I could build this kind of a relationship with another man and tell him some intimate things, get them off my chest and get a little bit of freedom from mm -hmm. who I used to be and not feel shamed, guilted, or have the whole world know about everything I did. So I started to trust the process. Mm -hmm. I made a misconception this time that we worked the steps and were cured. Yeah. yeah. Right? I'm like, woo, I, I think I'm good, right? I don't Over have to. beer. Well, not quite. It didn't start <laughs> like that. Um, it was, uh, oh, I don't need to go to a meeting today. And I'm working Monday to Friday on, on the road. So Friday, Saturday, Sunday are my only options. Saturday is my home group, so I always go, right? Mm -hmm. Friday night, I used to go there and then go for a movie. Sunday, I went because it's a good way to end the week. Mm -hmm. Well, after I finished the steps, all of a sudden, it's like, well, you know what? We could go to dinner and a movie because we don't need the Friday night meeting right? Still go to Saturday. Mm -hmm. And then a little while later, it's like, well, you know, I do have to be up at five in the morning to go to work. I'm going to sleep in the truck for four hours on the way to work so I can be tired. Mm -hmm. But I'm like, I don't need to go to Sunday night. Apathy and procrastination are creeping in. Mm -hmm. This comes from our literature in, in, in chapter seven. And if you want to read something about Narcotics Anonymous, read chapter seven in the basic text. It's recovery and relapse, right? Because mm -hmm. we're working on one or the other. And it says, as an addict, I have two inherent defects, apathy, a lack of concern or emotion and procrastination, putting off something important because uh, to a later date because of fear of the outcome or something along those lines. It's your definition of it. And it says I have these inherently. Mm -hmm. So that means if I want to not have them creep into my life because they're there if I'm an addict. And if you're an addict, they are there. They are waiting to come out. I need to do something in order to not allow this happen, to happen, right? Mm -hmm. So now I'm not going to Friday and I'm not going to Sunday. And all of a sudden, I'm finding reasons to not go Saturday as well. So I'm going to a meeting once a month, something like this. I get uh, invited to my old partner in crime's wedding on mm -hmm. an acreage. <clears throat> they're all using, they're going to be drinking. There's going to be cocaine there. I have the option to bring someone from Narcotics Anonymous with me. And I choose not to. Mm -hmm. I've been working on this relapse for a while. I've been working. Did you know, were you cognizant of no, that? No idea. I had completely verbally and personally believed I was going to go there and leave early. Like I'm in New and Lodge. Like, how am I getting home? I don't drive. I could have ride with someone. Like, there was no plan on coming mm -hmm. subconsciously or consciously. I'm not even sure. I get white girl wasted there i like i'm an embarrassment to everyone and everything there i convinced them to give me cocaine finally like they're like and my my partner in crime was i was the brains he was the brawn he's a scary scary dude mm -hmm. yeah like he was a scary scary dude and we we're an, an effective team and he's like you gotta go man like this is not okay my wife is not happy that you are this way at my wedding gets the dj to drive me home Drops me off, and these two girls I know that are meth addicts happen to be walking by my Just place. happen to be. Why is the meth always walking by? I live downtown. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. A lot of meth right? Down there, yeah. I'm like, <laughs> you're coming with me. Like, and yeah. they would go upstairs, I'm like, you're getting us drugs, and I got money because I'm working, right? Um, This is a 100-day relapse, and this is uh, interesting because it starts off with I miss a week of work because of that relapse. Like, all right, I go on a bender and I'm like, whoa, what's going on? This isn't okay. I lie my way back to work um, and I go to work Monday to Friday and it's fine. 
I mm-hmm. come back on the weekend. I've already relapsed, so I don't want to go hang out with the Narcotics Anonymous people. I've told them I've relapsed. I've told my main group, hey, I relapsed. Okay, what can we do? When do you want to come back? I'll let you know. Mm-hmm. And they're they're talking to me. And you know what? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to shout them out, Keith B. Um, wow. Like, that. this is what you do when your friend relapses in Narcotics Anonymous. You don't change anything in their friendship. Mm-hmm. You don't run away from them. You don't hide because it hurts you. And whatnot. You don't have to go sit on the couch and get high with them or watch them get high. But like, hey, I'm going to the Lord of the or the Hobbit this weekend. We've seen the first two together. I'm buying you a ticket. I will call you two hours before the show to see if you can facil- facilitate that right now. Mm-hmm. Right? Mm-hmm. You still matter. Right? I still care. Mm-hmm. Through the entire fucking relapse. <clears throat> Poppy too. Um, thank you so much coming home in a little care package in front of my door. Like we, we worked in, we lived in the same building. She'd go to work at, uh, let's just say 4.35 o'clock in the morning, look up, see my light on, just have a tear in her eye, right? But just to remind me that I'm still loved, that I'm still wanted and whatnot. I come home in the little care packages of cookies in front of my door and a note saying, I love you, you know? Mm-hmm. But I'm a weekend warrior, man. I got it licked, man. That set of steps cured me. You figured it out. I, it cured me, man. Mm-hmm. Right? Well, my, my higher power, and I'm a higher power guy. I'm not religious. Mm-hmm. My religion is Narcotics Anonymous, and that comes from my dad, who's one of the leading professors of the theologies in the world. Mm-hmm. He's like, you have a higher power, you have a Bible, and you have community. And that's what church is. So it's religion. NA is a religion. Well, I'm not saying that, but it, it's mine. Yeah. Like it is for me. My higher power started as a Narcotics Anonymous program and today has developed into a spiritual being that I have no idea. Like I can never describe to you because I'm not that smart. Mm-hmm. I just know he's there. Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. And I can align with that. Right. Yeah. So my higher power has a great sense of humor. He's like, oh, you think you got this, hey? Yeah. Here's, here's my, some hot chicks with meth. <laughs> here's, here's minus 50. Yeah. So all of a sudden work's been canceled for the month of December because I'm supposed to have two weeks off anyways. And the first, my, my boss is like, we're going to get nothing done. It is minus 50 for the next two weeks in the forecast. Um, anybody who has vacation pay that they haven't taken out because it was banked at this job, you can have it. And I'm like, what's vacation pay? And he's oh, like, no. he's like, oh, you didn't know you have $10,000. And I'm like, huh? And he's like, yeah, man, you got $10,000 here. Do you want it? And I'm like, yeah, I'm going to need it. <laughs> Right? Like, (laughs) worst 30 days of my life. Like, legit, the worst 30 days of my life. I am seeing my buddy Brandon there. I'm seeing my other friend Jared. And I'm I'm hanging out with this girl, Shannon. And Shannon and Brandon are pretty much the only two that come over to my house. Brandon brings me the drug. Shannon and I get high together and keep each other company. I don't leave my place for a month other than to maybe pick up at a couple other people I was picking up from. I'm telling my family the lies because they think I'm still kind of sober. They think think I'm are they buying it? Doing okay. I don't think my dad, I think my dad knew better. And I'm pretty sure my mom knew better because we had gone to Grey Cup together in November, her and I, and I drank and I told her I was drinking, but don't worry, it's okay. Mm. And I like blacked out the day. Like I was so hung over at the Grey Cup. Um, and uh, I don't think they're no, they know, know anything is going on. Or I think they know anything's going on, but my sisters don't. I walked through the door of Christmas dinner and I am a, my family, Christmas is a big deal. And all the smiles dropped. I've lost 30 pounds in 30 days, Mm -hmm. but I don't think I do. Right. I don't think I look like that. I realize they know immediately. I am overwhelmed with fucking shame. I, I can't think I am hot. I am obsessed with what I've done and the fact that they know and that I've broken their heart and I leave, I've always shared in the middle of dinner. I don't think that's probably accurate, but like immediately afterwards, I'm gone. I'm like, I gotta go. And I left and I went home in my mind to use to die. I had grandma heroin at home. Mm-hmm. And this is why I say, if I wanted to die, I'd be dead. Mm-hmm. I know how much to take to die, right? And I chose not to. I went home to not feel the way I felt and I fucking went hard for a week. I wake up on January 1st in my place. I am absolutely broke. I am completely broken. And I have come to the conclusion I have two options. I either need to kill myself or I need to get clean. Mm -hmm. 
I don't I, I don't have the balls to kill myself. I just know I don't. Like I I don't. I've thought of it more one option more one time throughout my life. Um and I just it's it's not something I'm capable of doing. I've thought about it clean. Mm-hmm. I've thought about it 10 years clean and I am 10 years clean now. My my clean date and I never said this is February 21st, 2014. I've been clean for 10 years, right? Mm-hmm. I've thought about it this year. Um, I don't follow through with it anymore because I know it's a thought, right? It's a moment. It's it's the disease of addiction trying to get me. That is what those thoughts are. Is the disease manifesting itself on my fears? Because mm-hmm. that is what this is all about, right? Yeah, I never I never had my first um, thought until I was nine months in recovery, right? Yeah, because we're no longer numbing ourselves. Yeah. I don't know about you, but I love it. And I hear it talked about all the time and I'll share it over and over and over again. Drugs was not a problem. Yeah. It was a solution. It was a solution to me being able, unable to um, process my emotions mm-hmm. and deal with them in a healthy manner. Mm-hmm. Right. I, I was at my gift of desperation as people talk about. And I like, I hated those things early on in recovery. I like uh, all the little things and today I love them because I, I realize where they come from, right? I understand what they mean today and it was a gift of desperation because I was freaking desperate that night, Daniel. Mm-hmm. And for the first time, I think in my life, I fucking truly prayed to God and I didn't really believe in him at this time. I kind of had faked it through the Narcotics Anonymous program and I like believed in the Narcotics Anonymous program and it says in step two in, in the 12 by 12 in Narcotics Anonymous, it says, if you need to use the Narcotics Anonymous program early on as a higher power, it works. It's loving, caring, kind, and it's full of spiritual principles, and it's a design for living. It will it will work, but you do need to develop from there. Mm-hmm. I prayed to God that night, like, please help me. I don't know what to do. And I fell asleep sometime really soon after that prayer. I woke up at an undetermined time later, and the most clear thought I'd had in a long time was you need to go to treatment. And I've never done that. Mm-hmm. My my detox was jail every time I come out relatively clean. Um, so I call those two people and I'm like, or message them like, hey, I'm going to go to detox. Mm-hmm. Okay, what do you need from me? I said, nothing. They said, I need to go to treatment. I need to surrender. I know what step one is because remember, I've worked the steps of narcotics and all this. I have a working understanding of them. I've just cho- chosen not to apply them in my life, right? Because I didn't have I hadn't read all the literature right today I've read most of the literature and I understand that it is a design for living right Mm -hmm. there's a promise in there right that that an addict any addict can lose the desire to use you know and find a new way of life Mm -hmm. and it also says in our literature that never have we seen an addict relapse that lives the narcotics anonymous program Mm. but that's the direction in there that, that, that's, that's a direction on how to do it. That is part of that design of living. That is, I need to live this program, not work it. And that, 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 that was huge. So, so I, need, I need to surrender because the spiritual action in, in, in step one, there's a lot of spiritual principles I need to get honest. I need to accept. I need humility right? That mm-hmm. humble action of saying, I'm an addict, man, and I need help, right? And I need to come to surrender. To me, that spiritual action is surrender. I need to wave the white flag. And that was really hard for me coming from the streets and the jails and whatnot. I did not like the word surrender. So uh, someone pointed me to the literature. At this time, I'm not reading the literature. P- people point stuff out to me. And I, I, I was telling you earlier, I learned better through osmosis, but today I'm learning to read Mm -hmm. I'm learning how I can read and I read in smaller increments and I highlight and I circle things because it makes me remember it. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, But it it says in there, surrender means I don't have to fight anymore. Mm. And that was, oh man, that was, that was huge for me, man. Mm -hmm. I fought my whole life, man. I fought in survival mode at, 16, 18 months old in um, foster homes because I didn't trust anybody because mm-hmm. my mom had abandoned me in my eyes, right? I had fought with feelings of not feeling good enough, the lack of self-worth, the fact that people would be better without me my entire growing up. Mm-hmm. I fought with watching the woman 
that I love more than anyone on the planet dying and fight like fought with those emotions and 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 god like fuck you we're we're, we're religious people man and you're taking her mm -hmm. you know i uh, i mean i have weird questions about whether you know like did, did she die for my sins kind of thing right because I, I know the bible right mm -hmm. i believe my mom's my angel mm. there is no scientific reason buddy that you can walk away with nine ounces of cocaine and come back a week later and still be alive yeah like that's not no like I, I mean no like i know what i did i know i know the kind of drugs and i was intravenous for most of it like i pumped it in me mm -hmm. over and over again there's no good reason i should be alive i believe i have an angel right so mm -hmm. um so what was it like then the 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 last time that you walked through the doors and you stayed what was your first year like Tell oh us about so it. i didn't stay right away um i still struggled with step two Mm -hmm. Okay, and step two, we come to believe that a power greater than ourselves could restore us to sanity. Mm -hmm. I've made the commitment to fake it till I make it and believe in the Narcotics Anonymous Power Program as my higher power. I'm okay with that because I know that from, from step two. And uh, that's my commitment to myself uh, early on, but I don't believe that I deserve to be restored to sanity. Mm. That was my struggle early on. Mm -hmm. I am a bad dude. I've done bad things. I have traumatized women. I have trauma. Can you imagine that poor pizza guy who like, and some of the stuff when we came through that freaking door, man, he's 16 years old, man. He got a gun shoved in his face. Mm -hmm. I, um, <clears throat> I was a junkie, right? And that's who I thought I was. Mm -hmm. The great sponsor at this time. And he was like, well, yeah, let's do the work. Because once we do this work, you no longer have to be bound by those titles. Mm -hmm. You can have freedom from that, right? And that's, that's huge, man. Mm -hmm. That's huge, right? Mm -hmm. So I needed to come to an understanding that, uh, oh, yeah. <clears throat> Anyways, January 2nd, I went into detox. Um, my clean date is February 21st. So until that time, every Sunday, I'm calling that girl over that I'm getting high with and blowing my clean time mm. purposely. Mm -hmm. They don't believe I deserve it. Mm -hmm. I'm not taking white key tags. I, not for me. I'm just here because I'm figuring out what I'm going to do. Mm -hmm. My buddy Shane H., <laughs> he asks me once on Friday, say, man, convention's coming up. I think you'd be great to be the MC. And I look at him like, why the heck would you want me to be the MC? I'm not even staying clean. And he just looks at me and he's like, and, and, and I said, and I'm, and I'm like, I don't even know if I want to be around Narcotics Anonymous. He's like, well, if you don't want to be around Narcotics Anonymous, you don't want to stay clean. Why do you keep coming back? I was so mad. I was so angry at him. Mm -hmm. I went, left the meeting. Like took off. I'm like, oh, I'm not staying here. Like blah, blah, blah. And I go home and I stew on it all night. And I remember right as I was laying in bed, I started laughing. And I'm like, why do I keep coming back? Because I belong here. Right? Because I'm loved here. Mm -hmm. Because I'm accepted here. Like, because <laughs> I, because these people are my people, man. Yeah. And, 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 and you, Shane. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So <laughs> I, I found him the next day and I'm like, hey. Does the offer still stand? Yeah. I'm ready to commit, right? I've been clean since that day. Yeah. Um, thank you, Shane. Yeah. Um, yeah. And it, uh, it was hard, man. My first two times in recovery, like that pink cloud lasted right until my relapse. Mm -hmm. Like it was just easy. There was no turmoil and whatnot. This time was tough, man. Like I struggled with self-worth because I, I got... I got connected quick and I started doing the work quick. I got my sponsor and I'm like, I'm ready to do the steps, mm -hmm. but I go, let's do the steps. Like, let's not just like this. I, I've looked back in my first set of steps. I found it not long ago. and like, there are one sentence answers. Right. And like, yes, no, you know, mm -hmm. I'm not digging into anything, mm -hmm. but I also don't understand it this time. My brain's not working very well, man. I am shooting crystal meth, like, you know, doing heroin stuff like that. Um, but we got we, we did a great set of steps and this guy jason jason r man, talk about finding the right people at the right time in your lives man mm -hmm. he was soft with me he was gentle with me because you had to be i came in hard and i was hard enough on myself and don't get me wrong i have guys where i'm really hard on them when i work the steps mm -hmm. because that's what they need right then their ego is real big and uh and, and they got they, they're tough and whatnot and they need to be broken down but i came in broken i came in my own worst enemy um and 
everything everyone did was against me. Right. And, and I've come to learn that nothing anyone was doing was against me. Mm -hmm. They either did it for them or they did it to try and help me. Right. I just saw everything as a personal attack. Mm -hmm. And that's fair. I was selfish and self centered because I needed to defend myself. I did. If I was not in survival mode, mm -hmm. I'd be dead. Mm -hmm. um, my friend who's a cop. <laughs> Out of the blue, when we're having lunch not too long ago, he says, you're kind of like a raccoon, he says. And I'm like, well, what do you mean by that? Like, I'm not sure if I take offense to that. He's like, no, no, no. <laughs> it, it's a good thing. He says, like, he says, you could live in a penthouse or a dumpster and you'd make it work and you'd make it look cool. And I was like <laughs> thinking about like a raccoon in a penthouse and I'm like, you know, like he's eating plums and like laying on the couch yeah, and then in a I'm towel. Think, yeah, in a towel. <laughs> yeah. And then I'm thinking about a raccoon in a dumpster. Yeah. But he's doing the same thing. Right? Yeah. The raccoon's doing the same thing. He's still kicking, matter kicking where he back is. on a on a pile of garbage with a rag over top of him and the half eaten plum that he found on the garbage. Not knowing the difference. Not knowing the difference because he's adaptable. Right? Life made me adaptable right from the very beginning. Right from my, being taken away from my mother, I had to survive and I had to take care of myself, right? So I came in very much in survival mode, right? Um, and that's okay. Yeah. If you come to Narcotics Anonymous, you come to any kind of treatment, uh, recovery program, sobriety, sobriety program, I like church, I don't care what you're doing to get better, right? And we were talking about this earlier and you made me stop and, and I... I, and I love that. And that's why I decided to come on this show this time is because I love how you bring all these different options to the table, right? Mm -hmm. um, it says, and it was pointed out to me today, and I don't know where it says in the Narcotics Anonymous uh, literature, we must remember that Narcotics Anonymous is not the only way. That really helped me a lot because I was like super judgy. You were one of those, eh? Oh, I was too. Up until like this year, man. Yeah. And like, this is how it is, man. Yeah. You don't do it like this, you're going to die. You know what, yeah. man? Today, I don't care if you need God. I don't care if you are on harm reduction. I don't care if you're hooked on fishing with Tommy LaPlante, right? I, I don't <laughs> care how you get clean. You're, you're no longer selling your body. You're no longer selling your soul. You're no longer doing armed robberies. You're no longer abandoning your children and you're no longer doing a disservice to yourself. I got you. Mm -hmm. I back you. Mm -hmm. And I love you for it. Mm -hmm. 100%, right? Mm -hmm. So I'm in survival mode here and I'm doing the work and it's hard because I'm looking at me, right? We get into like four and step four and five, right? Actually, no, I'll go back to three because I haven't touched on three, right? Mm -hmm. Turn our will over to the care of a higher power, right? The God of our understanding. What does that mean, right? Super easy at this point in time because I've chosen the Narcotics Anonymous program as my, my higher power. And, and you've come to believe. And I've come to believe. Genuinely. Okay, so, and, and, and I'll go back to this because I had this conversation recently. We need to find hope in step two. Yeah. And hope will lead to faith as two becomes three. But faith has to become trust before I'm going to go into four, right? Because in four, I do a searching and fearless moral inventory. And I don't care if you're an addict or not. You should do the Narcotics Anonymous steps. I I've, will, I've heard that. I, I think will everyone, send them to you. Everyone should do them. I, I yeah. will send them to you and I will even help you walk through them if you want. You just get a hold of me through this podcast here and whatnot. I will gladly go through it with you. Do a searching and fearless moral inventory, right? Mm -hmm. And like, wow, I'm, I, and, and I wanted to talk about this too, because I'm doing one right now. I, I, I finished four, two days ago, 10 years clean. It's been five years since I've done one, but it's my sixth set of steps. I'm going through some stuff in life. This has been the hardest year of my life. Mm -hmm. The hardest year of my life. Um, I don't need to get into why. Um, I got to share about some of that at the Narcotics Anonymous convention here, right? Mm -hmm. Searching and fearless moral inventory, like fearless, right? So how do I, how do, I do a fearless uh, moral inventory? Well, I ask my higher power that I now trust for courage mm -hmm. and clarity and acceptance and understanding, right? Because I need these things to take a look at who I am. Here's a great thing too. Uh, and I have to do this today. And maybe, maybe you can, maybe you can be very first person. Hmm. My, I, I heard this speaker the other day and he said, so when you do your four and I'm supposed to do this at the beginning, but I'm going to do it at the end because my sponsor thinks it's a great idea. And like, we're both adding it to our sponsorship thing now. I, I would like you to give me one asset I have and one defect I have. And you can be as honest as you want. I, I'm ready to hear it. Like, mm -hmm. And he wants, so I'm going to ask 10 people this. 
Mm -hmm. And I'm going to get this list of like what other people see, right? Because as, a, as we do a searching and fearless moral inventory, we're not looking at a shit list here. We already know the shit list, right? We're looking at the morals behind it, right? We're looking at the resentments behind it and why they come up. Like for me, and this came up this time, people pleasing and, um, and, and um, anger came out. And both of those things are me holding back uh, how I truly feel mm -hmm. because I fear it's going to hurt other people. Mm -hmm. I fear that, and this is what my sponsor brought up, and this blew me away, and I'm, I'm fixated on this right now. I fear of letting go of my will on the outcome. That's my fear. Fear of letting go of the outcome. I hold on to people, places, and things, because as long as I hold on to it, I have some say in the outcome. But if it's not working for me and whatnot... I need to let it go. So one of the big ones for me right now, I've never let, I've never turned my will over on my finances. I make a lot of money right now and I live paycheck to paycheck, mm -hmm. like ridiculous amount of money. And I live <laughs> paycheck to paycheck, right? Because yeah. I, I'm not willing to seek help in, in dealing with it. And that's, I have a commitment with a friend today and with my sponsor today that I'm going to start focusing on that in this 10th year. That is one of my focuses is to get a grip on finances. And that means I'm probably going to have to do a little bit of research on how to budget. Mm -hmm. I don't even know how. Mm -hmm. How would I? I hit the streets at 16. Yeah. Right? And I never took a look at it. Anyways, we do the searching fearless moral inventory. Could, could you do me a favor? And, and, and off the top of your head, what, what is an asset that I have as Peter that you know? Asset um, would be your willingness to your willingness to be in places like this, your willingness to be vulnerable, your I willingness to, uh, to serve others in, in, inside and outside of the program. I love that. Thank yeah. you so much. And could, could you give me a defect of mine? You know me well enough to know, at least know some of my defects. Um, I, I don't want to get too much into detail on no, that. No, no, it's all right. I, I would say the relationships you seek. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'm okay with that. Um, right. And, and, and taking a look at that today. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. And, and I don't just mean romantic relationships too, because I, I seek some unhealthy relationships outside, uh, romance too. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, and uh did that throw you no not at all <laughs> no it's it's fair um it, and, and it's fair it's it's good and i appreciate that right mm -hmm. so so we're in this searching and fearless moral inventory um i look back at my i haven't looked back recently i know my first searching and fearless moral inventory is about five pages long mm -hmm. there's 85 questions mm -hmm. you're supposed to write down your resentments and then there's several questions based around um, all of those people. So you can have, oh, two, 300 answers, more than that, probably 400. I just finished and I thought it was 46 pages. I, 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 I counted it last night. It's 84 pages, oh. 84 pages. I, I have an answer that's three and a half pages long. Mm -hmm. One answer. Mm -hmm. Um, but that's a testament to recovery. That's a testament to where I'm at today. That's a testament to my willingness. One of the things that I haven't mentioned yet, and, and this goes back to base recovery. Honesty, open-mindedness, and willingness. With these, we are well on our way. And this comes from the literature again. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to quote it wherever I can, especially mm -hmm. when I can do it word for word. Honesty, open-mindedness, and willingness. With these, we are well on our way. And I'm a firm believer that the line that's missing in there is that without them, we are effed. Right? Mm -hmm. You have no hope. You need to be willing, you need to be able to commit to trying to be honest, trying to be open, trying to be willing. And that's not going to be perfect, but mm -hmm. you need those three things. You need to honestly, and that's why, going back to step one, that's why we admit that we're an addict. It's the first honest admission some of us make, mm -hmm. right? The open-mindedness to a higher power, right? And the willingness to turn it over, step one two and three. And there's more spiritual principles to each of those, right? I highly recommend you read the green and gold and, 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 hi and, and highlight every spiritual principle, have a list of them there and highlight it every time it comes up. Cause it's pretty interesting to see the evolution and why, like these steps are a miracle. Mm -hmm. They are a gift from God. Mm -hmm. Like you talk about the 10 commandments, man, these are, these are my 12 commandments, right? These are and, and I'd be re like, now that I know what they do and what they do in my life, I would be absolutely insane. I would go back to the insanity because remember I was, I'm being restored to sanity. 
in step two. I would be, and I do go back to that insanity mm -hmm. by choosing not to live them in my life. I know the promise. Mm -hmm. I know that if I live this program, I will not relapse. But I still, because I'm human and because apathy and procrastination are a huge, they're inherently mine. They are part of my core. I mm -hmm. cannot get rid of them. If I am not, and what's the word I'm looking for? Diligent, right? If I don't, oh, if I'm not willing, mm -hmm. right? Because like you said, I'm going to go backwards, right? And I had some fears come up in my life. And that's why I'm doing this set of steps. Big fears. Um, I have one reservation in my program. And I was honest with my sponsor and he's okay with this. After 10 years. After 10 years, I have one reservation. Mm -hmm. If both my children die, I make you no promises. Mm. I can't promise you. I'm not saying I'm going to go out and use. Mm. Cannot promise that I'm willing to navigate that kind of pain. Okay. Mm -hmm. Again, I may as well go buy a lot of Max ticket because the odds on both of them dying like pretty slim. It can happen. Car accidents happen. Um, you know. Yeah. Uh, nature uh, can can do its course, right? But but I don't, I don't believe in my heart. I have faith that that's not going to happen, mm -hmm. right? So. For the most part, I am reservation free, right? Mm -hmm. So now, and like uh, my sponsor and I, we had to stop because my, my, my step uh, four was so long. We had to stop last night. We're going to finish at 5.30 today. Man, I'm looking forward to it. Um, mm -hmm. Five is, is, is reading it. with I, I'm, I'm drawing a blank on the words. Um, so, so am I. Uh, uh, become, uh, oh no, how can we both forget this? Okay, four, we... You're searching for a small inventory five. Uh, share with yourself another uh, God and another human God being. God and another human exact being. Nature of our the wrongs. exact nature of our wrongs, yeah. right? There we go. Um, so we're technically like as as the steps were formed because we've adopted the AA steps, as most people know, which were written in the 30s and 32. Does that sound right? Mm -hmm. uh, we were developed in 52 or something like that. We've adopted them and just changed a couple words and whatnot, right? Um, and we're a program of addiction, not drugs. Mm. Right. We're, we, we focus on addiction because we understand, right. As, as I'm working on today, my disease has manifested itself in different ways today. I don't think of using, mm -hmm. it's not even a, it's not even a conversation anymore. Mm -hmm. Has it crossed my mind when I'm struggling with stuff that like, oh, I wouldn't mind getting wasted not thinking about this. Yeah, sure. Like I'd be a liar and not human if I didn't think about that. But like, if I even gone to the bar and looked at a drink, oh man, no way. Cause I can play the tape to the end. Mm -hmm. I know I'll black out and uh, I know I'll be searching out meth in like 17.6 seconds. Some hot chick with meth will walk by. Yeah. That's yeah. my <laughs> luck too, right? <laughs> yeah. Like that's, that's been the narrative, right? And, <laughs> yeah. uh, I, I believe that things happen for a reason and they happen for me for a reason, right? So I'm, I'm currently in five right now, I guess, uh, because I'm sharing that with someone else and um, with my higher power. And it's great because I already know it. My higher power already knows it, right? But it's that the morals behind it. Now, I got a great sponsor today. I'm super fortunate because not only does he share the experience, another thing from our literature, the therapeutic value of one addict helping another is without parallel. And I agree with it completely. I have done counseling. I've done OSAP. I've done all this stuff where these professionals help me and they have no idea about addiction. Mm -hmm. They lack that empathy. Mm -hmm. Empathy for me, true empathy is save for those with like experiences. Mm -hmm. Like I had a sponsee come up to me once and we started talking and rape came up. It's not an experience I had, but I had a sponsor who did have that experience once. And I said to him, before we get too far into this, I said, do you mind if I suggest that you go to someone else? I said, because I, I, I can empathize with your feelings of not being worthy that I'm sure you felt of not feeling that was fair, right? A, a lot of those feelings I can empathize with, but I can't empathize with that experience. And I think I would be doing you an injustice to try and help you heal from that, if mm -hmm. that makes any sense at all, right? Mm -hmm. um, so I'm, yeah, I'm doing this step steps with a guy who's not only got that experience, right? And, and, and it's, again, my higher power brings the right people into my life, man. He's literally been through half the stuff that I am dealing, more than half, the two major events that I'm going through in my life right now, he's shared that experience, right? Mm -hmm. And on top of that, he works at a treatment center and he has schooling and whatnot. So I'm getting like, I'm getting a double whammy here on, on, on it and whatnot. And, and he's, um, he's, uh, pointing out, um, or he's, he's helping me discover the morals behind some of my actions, mm -hmm. right? 
and the feelings and it's interesting, Daniel, they all stem from fear. So I think we're, uh, I think we're coming to the end, brother. Oh yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, I would love to have you back. Uh, I know Anytime. there's probably some things that we haven't touched on, but well, it's, all, it's always evolving. Yeah. Right. It's interesting too, because we got to four and five, which is exactly where I'm at right now. Yeah. Um, and so I think that's a, even a great place to get to, right. Uh, because although I've done the steps before and, and, and clearly like I've, I've come to have that spiritual awakening as a result of working these steps, mm -hmm. I, I'm learning because it's, it's always learning. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm always learning. Mm -hmm. I'm learning to practice those principles in all of my affairs. And today, like what, what would I say? I'd say probably 80% of my affairs. I'm really good at practicing them in. Mm -hmm. I struggle with relationships and finances and it mm -hmm. talks right in our, it, it, it talks right in our, our literature that those are the two things we really struggle with letting go of. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Someone yeah. out there today struggling how you were, mm -hmm. what would you tell them? Uh, I love you. Um, I remember the struggle. If you want a new way of life, it starts with surrender. For me, surrender is brief detox, um, followed by treatment. I, I did not do the treatment path because by the time it, the opportunity arose, I was four months clean again and working a solid program of recovery. So I often give the bed to someone else, but do not be scared to look for help. There are people out there that care about your recovery and want to help you in your recovery, right? But you need to make the first step. It comes with that honest admission and that surrender. Awesome. Yep. Thanks so much for, ha for coming today. Oh, thanks for having me. Yeah. Um, it was an honor having you, buddy. I know we've known each other for a long time. Yeah. Uh, very first production in the new studio. I love it. Can't imagine a, a better guest to have it. And, uh, and that's it. Great. Thanks. Yeah. If you got anything out of that episode today, please hit that like button at the bottom of the screen. Please leave us a comment. Let us know your thoughts. Um, let us know if you'd like to hear something, if you'd like to see something in future episodes. We basically, we want to build community. We want to build relationships. We are stronger together. Um, if you're not yet subscribed, please hit that subscribe button. We're also on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, all of those audio platforms. If you want to watch us while, or if you want to listen while you're driving. Uh, anyways, that's all I got for you guys today. Thank you so much for joining me in this very first episode from the new studio. We will see you again soon. Take care. Say, this is Hard Knocks Talks. <laughs>